and welcome back to Beyond the To-Do List. I am your host, Eric Fisher, and it's almost 2024. We've all been stressed and busy. I mean, we already were, even before 2020, but I can't believe that that quick succession of years, 2020, 2021, 22, 23, it's going to be 2024. And honestly, this has me in a bit of an introspective mood or mode. And obviously, traditional productivity thought says we need to close out the year well and start the new one well also. But let's be real. That's hard. There's a rush to close all the loops, set all the goals, and then succeed with all of them as New Year's resolutions. And and I don't know about you, but I hate that pressure. So I decided I want to take a little time to revisit two shows in particular from this past year about being more human. See, because over the course of those years that I just rattled off, I've kind of felt like that's slipping away a little bit. Or there would be moments that I would notice my humanity and my being, or whatever you want to call it, moments in community, camaraderie, or even solitude, but with art or nature. And that's why this week I wanted to revisit a conversation I had with Gretchen Rubin, podcaster and author. I had this conversation earlier this year with her about her book, Life in Five Senses, how exploring the senses got me out of my head and into the world. And basically, her book is about her transformative experience of heightened sensory perception after she realized the potential loss of her sense of sight and then had a subsequent deep appreciation for basically life's ordinary moments. And I love that. And in this conversation, we talk about that as well as the difference of, but also the meshing of analog and digital experiences. Let's face it, we're living in both those worlds. We discuss the value of live analog experiences like concerts and art and cooking. Speaking of cooking, we talk about taste preferences and differences. And obviously, we talk about all the senses, really. But I just can't help but think productivity isn't just about doing things or checking things off. It's a means to an end. And that's why we talk about topics like the five senses in this podcast, because we often need new and fresh moments of clarity to check in with ourselves. I'm often using the phrase self-awareness on this show a lot, and there's a reason for that. Knowing what you want, learning how others have accomplished that without burning out, without selling your soul, and without just being a flurry of busy activity, but instead being strategic and purposeful and intentional, that's the goal. Anyway, that's what I hope you get as you listen to this conversation. And I hope if you've heard it before, it resonates deeper this time as you spend time with friends, family, and in meaningful moments during this holiday and New Year season. Also, we've got a mailbag episode coming up. If you've got a burning productivity problem or question, head on over to beyondthetodolist.com, click the contact button in the top part of the site, and it'll send a message right to me at my email. Again, that's beyondthetodolist.com, and then click the contact button at the top of the site to send me a message. All right, I'm going to get out of the way. Enjoy this conversation with Gretchen Rubin. Well, this week, it is my privilege to welcome back Gretchen Rubin to the show. Gretchen, welcome back to Beyond the To-Do List. I'm so happy to be back and getting the chance to talk to you. It's so fun to talk to you. And you're a podcaster in your own right, so I always feel really refreshed. It's becoming more of a habit, I think, or more of a commonplace where somebody I talk to is also a podcaster, or at least has guested on many podcasts. You have been doing both for a very long time, not to mention writing. And that's one of the things that we're here to talk about. You've got a brand new book. It's called Life in Five Senses, How Exploring the Senses Got Me Out of My Head and Into the World. And I want to talk to you about what the origin story of this book is. But I want to say, as soon as I saw it, I thought to myself, this is a real key book for me. So personal side note, I'm sure you're familiar with the Enneagram. Yeah. I'm a five and fives get stuck in their head and to get out of their head, have to get into their body. And that's mm -hmm. where the five senses come in. So I was like, oh my gosh, this is like a handbook for being a healthy five on the Enneagram scale. I'm curious if you've had anybody give you that feedback yet at all. 
Not at all. And I have a couple of books about the Enneagram. I'm going to run and look that up because I hadn't made that connection. You know how when you learn about something like and you know it, but you don't connect it to something that you learn later, you know, like you yes. don't connect the dots until somebody points them out and then you can connect two things that you sort of already know about. So I'm really I'm writing myself a note right now. That's a great point. I have heard, you know, because I love any kind of categorization, like I have my four tendencies quiz that divides people into four tendencies. I love any kind of self-knowledge quiz or self-knowledge framework. So I know the Enneagram. And now I'm really excited to think about it in connection with the five senses. So, okay, insight dropping right here in front of us. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and again, it's big and bold right there in the title, five. So for me, it's even more kind of a, there's a subtle call out to it as well. Wow. Nicely done to make that connection. Okay. So the, the five and the five senses. Okay. I'm running to my bookshelves right after we're done talking to pull out my volumes. Yeah. So, but for you, and you know, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of asking you what your, I mean, you would have probably said it already if you knew that you were a five and you probably would have thought about that. Um, but we don't have to go into that. But for you, this process, I'm always curious when authors come to a point of saying, I have a new book idea and you can kind of see the trail from book to book to book. And it's, you know, interesting yeah. of, oh, we talked about this and then that pointed me in this direction. And then this next book came. This one's, I think, a little bit different where it's just a natural progression. I think it's actually more of a, a current Current events is probably not the best way to put it, but where we find ourselves in our lives right now on a global scale, we've all kind of had to be sequestered and had our routines change and, in other words, massive shifts in thoughts and ideas and emotions. And so that's kind of where I thought, okay, I can see where she's coming from. Obviously, you had a catalyzing event that kickstarted this whole process of a year-long journey through all five senses. I'd love for you to tell basically that superhero origin story for this book. Well, as you say, when I look back on my previous work and other things that I've done, the groundwork was there, but I just, I hadn't seen it myself. Like I hadn't put together the pieces. And I did, I had this sort of epiphany moment where, so I'm a person who gets, I'm kind of prone to pink eye. So I get pink eye from time to time, usually it goes away on its own, but one time it was really sticking around. So I went to the eye doctor and got my amateur diagnosis confirmed. And then as I was getting ready to leave, he said to me very casually, like, oh, well, you know, be sure to come in for your next checkup. You know, you're at risk for losing your eyesight. So, you know, you don't want to miss a trip. And I was like, wait, what are you talking about? I didn't know that. And he said, oh, yeah, you know, you're very severely nearsighted. And that means you're at greater risk of a detached retina. And if that happens, you can lose some of your vision. So we would want to catch it right away. And I had a friend who had lost some of his vision to a detached retina. So this was very real to me. And I mean, I went out on the street and, you know, intellectually, of course, I knew that I could lose any of my senses at any time. And I knew of two that I could still have a rich and fulfilling and meaningful life if I did lose my senses. But it somehow just hit me that I really could lose my sense of sight. And at that moment, I realized, and I'm not appreciating it all. I don't take any time thinking about it, reveling in it. You know, if I did lose my sight, I would feel so much regret for everything that I hadn't noticed that was happening right in front of me. At the moment that I was having this realization, it, it was like every knob in my brain just cranked up to 11. And I could see everything with crystal clarity. I could hear every noise. I could smell. You know, I live in New York City pretty smelly place. I could smell all these smells. I could feel, you know, the cold sidewalk below my feet and the wind in my face. And it was just all my senses just was just sort of this psychedelic experience. And again, I live in New York City, so I was walking home from the eye doctor and it lasted for that walk. And it was just, it was a transformative walk. I just, I never had felt the world with such clarity. But I realized like, I could do this at any time. This is like, I'm not strapping some gizmo to my face. It's just that I haven't been paying attention. I have the power to appreciate my ordinary days so much more than I have been. And I just thought, you know, I was in this kind of fog of constant preoccupation and, you know, walking around lost in my own thoughts. And I thought I need to get out into my body. And the way to do that is through my five senses and really connect with the world and with other people and with myself. 
And then looking back, I realized I'd been sort of edging up on this in a lot of indirect ways. But this is where it all crystallized to me. And like, I really want to live my life in all five senses. I had a little bit of a, a sliver of that. Also an eye doctor experience. Uh-huh. Yeah, I did not wear glasses until about, let's say, February of 2021. We're recording this in March 2023. So it's been about two years now. I'm actually, ironically, I am going to the eye doctor for an annual checkup today (laughs) as as of time of this recording. Go to the eye doctor. Yeah. So everybody warning, regular reminder, here you go. But I'd been having issues and I thought, you know what? I have trouble driving at night. Things are blurry at times. And I thought to myself, you know what? What if I go to the eye doctor and just say, hey, I'm having trouble driving at night. Is there any kind of like driving glasses for at night, not thinking like I was just like, no, I've had 20, 20 vision my whole life. Well, creeping up into mid forties, it's like, oh, I'm past that threshold of now that's going to start deteriorating. And I start going through, they do the test and they're like, well, you need glasses. And I'm like, what? And they're like, you need bifocals. And I'm like, what? And I'm like, I don't feel blind. I just feel like at night things are just whatever. Anyway, longer story shorter, I go, I get the prescription, I order the glasses, they come in, I get them, I bring them out into the car and I put them on for the very first time. And I'm like, there's individual leaves on that tree. I had that same, I had it like it's, you know, seven, eight years old, but it's amazing, right? Yeah. And it it just, it kind of, so it was a singular sense, but it was that very moment that I thought, oh my gosh, I've been missing out. So I've been trying to, again, and that's why this is kind of a timely book for me. It's been two years. We tend to have revelation moments and then kind of ease back out of them. Like you said, that it lasted for that walk home. So, but what was the jumping point from you having that walk home and that kind of moment of clarity there to saying, you know what? I need to write about this. I need to experiment with this. Well, I was just instantly seized by this determination to just go deep into an exploration of the five senses. And I'm a very systematic person. And I'm also kind of a street scientist where I'm always experimenting on myself. I'm like my own guinea pig. And and the only way I could really understand something is to like read about it and take notes and then write about it to figure out what I think or to get myself to do something. So I had this epiphany and I thought, I need to do this. You know, I wrote The Happiness Project, which was all about sort of understanding happiness and how to make myself happier. And I thought, I need to do something That's going to put me through the research, the experimentation and the learning that can come from it if I'm really going to grapple with this in a serious way. Because you're right, it's very easy to have an epiphany. It's very easy to feel changed, but it's hard to be changed. (laughs) And that takes a lot of work. And so for me, the way I do it is I write a book and that, that keeps me on track. And that kind of lasts long enough for real change to happen. It really sinks in over time. But the minute that I got home, I was really seized by a determination to go deep. I knew that this was the path that I wanted to take because I've been writing about happiness and human nature for, you know, more than a decade. I think about it all the time, but I did have the feeling that something was missing. I felt like there was something that I was overlooking. There was something that I was missing. And then when I had that experience, it all clicked in and I was like, this is the piece that I've been missing. And so I was very excited to have identified it and then to like see a framework where I could explore it. I think one of the interesting things also, again, that ties into like one of the longstanding preoccupations that I have is analog versus digital. And I know that digital can aid. We spend so much time in the digital world. We forget that we kind of hear, oh, digital bad or, you know, get off your phone or, you know, too much screen time. In other words, blanket statements that are well-meaning, but not necessarily helpful per se. And I think one of the things that really is interesting to me is some of these senses can be aided by digital. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing that replaces getting out in the world, whether that's, you know, your own circle of, you know, area that you can go in or further and beyond with travel, et cetera, and being analog about things. I mean, I don't know what I'd do without digital. Well, let me say this. I'm thinking of sound. I'm thinking of auditory. I'm a huge music fan, Mm. but I love going to concerts, which I kind of, you know, they're using digital technology, but to me, that's an analog thing because it's, it's experiencing live performance of music, et cetera. But ultimately having digital music on my phone at all times, allowing me to not just have it on as background music, but to be able to like sit and actually observe is a word that you use with seeing, but contemplative listening or just 
pure enjoyment for the sake of music. Like what we used to do when we were teenagers, where we'd open up the album and look through the liner notes while we had our headphones on in our bedroom and we were in our own little world. Like that's what I'm trying to get back to myself personally, at least a little bit, especially because of this book. Well, that's that's a really interesting point. And I think a lot of people who write about the five senses and what, you know, whatever approach they take do tend to be sort of very anti-technology. And I have to say that I'm very pro-technology when it's used wisely, because I think you're right. A lot of times it can really amplify or make things more convenient or give us opportunities that we wouldn't otherwise have. I think that the challenge is for each of us to say, well, where is technology getting in my way and undermining my like my happiness and my sense of connection to the world instead of bolstering it? So, for instance, one of my favorite little exercises, if you're the kind of person who can't get off your phone, is I'm like, turn your phone to grayscale. Have it be in black, white and gray instead of full color. And you will find it much easier to stay off your phone because it's just it's much less enticing and it's much less convenient to use a phone in black, white and gray. By the way, this is a way to get your kids off their devices if you just switch it and tell them that it's broken and you can't fix it. But I agree with you that there is often it really will put opportunities in your mind. Like I go to the Met every day and from time to time, like I'll listen to music while I walk around and kind of have a soundtrack. It really dramatically changes my experience. Now, I'm not a person who does that very often, but I can imagine that for some people that would be a really important and significant part of that experience. And it's really only possible because of how easy it is now for us to carry around thousands of songs in our pockets and pick and choose very easily. But, you know, it's interesting what you say about the album, because I do hear people talk about like, in a way, it's so convenient to have all that music and probably you'd make that trade. There is something lost because the cultivating of the collection that people would come and see and the excitement of handling the album and looking at the art and the liner and just the physicality of it. And so it's a bug and a feature. It was a huge pain to schlep all that stuff around and have to store it. But on the other hand, it's kind of fun to have it and display it. When we love something, we often want to show it to other people and share it that way. So a lot of times these things are complicated. It's not that one is right and one is wrong or one is better and one is worse, but it's just like you sort of have to pick and choose. And I think what we want to do is to be aware of, wow, I really get something from a concert that I don't get from listening to something in my living room. Therefore, I want to make space for that in my calendar and in my budget to go hear live music rather than saying, oh, it's illegitimate to listen to music on your smartphone because that's not good or something, which some people seem to just kind of dismiss it all. And I think there's a lot of good to be had. Yeah, there definitely is. And for me, again, there's a power to music. I remember there was one summer and even then into the fall, I was taking time off. I had done a year of college and I was going to take a semester off. So I had all summer and then that fall semester and I was working in a warehouse and my saving grace was my Walkman. Yeah, Walkman. I was using tapes. I was using tapes because CDs skip. I recorded or copied over like favorite tracks and even full favorite albums onto tapes and just the perception of time, the perception of how hard work was or wasn't due to the music. It was just this transforming moment in time and experience. And I've been curious to see if that happens to other people. I, you know, some people I know have had conversations with them, you know, friends and family, et cetera. And they seem to say, yeah, similar experience. I just don't know outside of myself. Another reason to get into the senses is to connect with other people. But yeah, that's just been one of the kind of milestone chunk of like nine months that really drove that home and said, there's a power, not just to music, but like sound and soundscapes and just imagination and even just closing your eyes, maybe focusing on specific senses and closing other ones off to really dive deeper into them. When one sense goes down, the other ones, you know, become more aware. That's why the lights go down. When you're going to a concert, why you close your eyes when you're kissing, you know, like you have more attention for whatever's left. Or like also if you, if you really want to focus, like if I'm I'm a very fearful driver and so I'll often turn off the radio when I'm driving so I can see better, you know, and it's like why, you know, because you just it's where is your attention going? Yeah, so it is it can be it can be helpful and it can also just be fun to sort of play with what kind of sensory information you're doing. As one of my exercises, I did a dining in the dark where you wear a mask while you're eating. So you eat without seeing your food or the people around you. And it was really interesting. It very much changed the experience, as you can imagine. I remember there being a scene in a movie. 
I think it's called about time or something like that. I know that I should know this because time is a very important facet of productivity, but it's the one where the guy can go in a closet and like time travel back to any moment in his life. And anyway, there's a scene where he meets his future wife and it's like a double date and it's in a, like you get escorted down and you get sat and there's no light and you eat in the dark. And anyway, that's, that's what that reminded me of. Obviously, Getting into our bodies and focusing on the senses and really not just enjoying them, but kind of cherishing them and really holding them as something that's special and integral is important, not just for the sake of, I say it's productive to live a full life. That's kind of the aim of productivity in a, in a way. It's not just about our senses making us feel life richer, but there's other benefits too. And you talk to those in the book beyond just sensing things stronger, it goes way beyond that. No, you can use it to calm anxiety and, you know, to sort of feel less stress. You can use it to just have more fun, just lighten up. You can use it to connect with other people. You can use it to evoke memories and preserve memories. I'm somebody who doesn't remember things my own life very well. So I'm always looking for ways to like make memories more solid. You can use it great for sparking creativity. I thought, oh, I bet this might spark my creativity. I was not prepared for like how much creativity this would just sort of unleash into myself. You can use it to help yourself like stop snacking. All sorts of hacks about like, what if you need to quiet a crowd? What if you need to make small talk with a stranger? Like the five senses offer all sorts of sort of transcendent benefits, but then also like super kind of day-to-day hacks. I was surprised by in how many directions the five senses took me in terms of just making my life happier or healthier or more productive or more creative. So you went on a journey over a year kind of experimenting and doing different, you know, self experiments, as you say, about the five senses for yourself. I'm curious, kind of two part question here. One is, how did you structure that experimentation over the course of a year? And then what were some of your favorite or or even most surprising findings from Mm. those experiments? Well, this is a thing. Okay, Eric. So always for me, it's structure. What is the structure of a book? And I will spend years researching and thinking about a subject before I understand what the structure is. And then inevitably, I pick a structure where, where anybody reading the final book would say, what other structure could you pick? This is the most obvious structure. And yet for me, it's been months and months of like sweat pouring down my face trying to figure it out. So with the five senses, okay. First, I was like, no, it's going to be 11 senses or maybe it's nine senses. It's like sort of the five kindergarten. You could call the five senses, the Aristotelian senses or the kindergarten senses. That's seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. Plus then I had these other ones that I was going to do. So was it nine? Was it 11? I went back, I went forth. And then, you know, a friend of mine, I was talking to her and she's like, you know, I think you should just talk about the five senses. And I was like, you know what? I think you're right. So then I had the five senses. Plus then I had a a section that was called sensorium. And that was about all how our senses all work together. And then my editor said, you know what? By the time I get to five, I'm kind of ready for it to be done. And so the structure of the book is the five senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching in that classic kindergarten Aristotelian order, which makes sense if you think about why they're in that order. But although you might think, oh, gosh, she just grabbed the most obvious structure. It actually took me so much intellectual labor to get there, which I think ended up making the book better. But it it was hard. You know, the most surprising thing I learned is kind of the most obvious thing that I should learn. And you, you mentioned it in your talk about going to the eye doctor, which is how we all live in our own sensory world. Like you think, oh, the I kind of thought, well, yeah, we all have our own, you know, individual makeup, but we're we're basically the world is the world. No, we're seeing we perceive such different sensory experiences. And so you say you didn't realize how much your vision had been affected. That's very, very common. It's very common for people not to realize how much hearing they're not hearing. There's a I read a memoir of a guy who was a partner in a law firm And he was 34 years old before he realized that he had, you know, pretty significant hearing loss. He just thought everybody heard the way that he did. They just coped with it better. It's not uncommon for people to be like young adults before they realize they're colorblind or that they don't have a sense of smell. We just have this natural assumption that people perceive the world the way we do. And you also, your brain is not an objective reporter. Your brain is trying to tell you what it thinks Eric wants to know and needs to know. And my brain is telling Gretchen what Gretchen needs to know and wants to know. And again, like I live in New York City and 
we're on a podcast and it could very well be that a siren will start to go. And I guarantee you, you will hear the siren coming through the microphone and I will not hear it because my brain is like, we don't need to hear sirens. But somebody said to me, oh, in LA, people don't hear the helicopters because those are so common that the brain just puts them into the background. It doesn't signal them as information. I had a similar experience where, and this was something that had puzzled me for years. So I know more than a decade ago, I quit sugar. I have this such a powerful, uncontrollable sweet tooth that I thought, you know what? I just want to give it up altogether that, you know, I'm an abstainer, not a moderator. It's easy for me to have none than to have a little bit. I'm just going to quit eating sugar. It's too boring to have this always in my head. So I gave up sugar and it wasn't that hard for me. And over the years, people have said to me, like, why was it that harder for you? Like, you're, we're all so surrounded by these cues. You know, you, you turn on the TV, you open up social media, you walk down the street and you see all, you know, you're in an airport and you just see these rows and rows of delicacies and you smell this stuff and you're constantly reminded it's in the cabinet at home or at work. Like, how, why does this not bother you? And I thought, why doesn't it? Like, I have this really bonkers sweet tooth, but now it doesn't bother me. Why not? I, I just was truly puzzled by that. And then I realized that, it, you know, after I stopped eating sugar, my brain was just like, this is an interesting information for Gretchen. She doesn't need to know this. She doesn't respond to those things. It's like seeing a, a, an enticing display of dog food. It's useful. It's there. It's just not useful to me. Or like uncooked oatmeal and, and rice. It's like, that's not interesting to me. I wouldn't reach for that. I could dial into it. Of course, if I pay attention, then I notice, oh, like the, the beautiful smell of the bakery. But it just doesn't tug at my mind the way that I think it does for some people. And I, I think that's why I think that at a certain point, my brain just turned down that knob because it wasn't useful. So my sensory experiences are really very different from other people's sensory experiences because of my sort of idiosyncratic inner landscape. Okay, I know that there's a lot of people out there wondering the question of before the dial got turned all the way down, there was probably some difficulty, at least in the early stages of, again, with your self-confessed such a strong sweet tooth. Do you have any kind of, I mean, again, it's been 10 years. Do you have any kind of recollection as to the kind of early moments of trying to turn that dial down, whether that was intentional or if it was byproduct of your systematic approach, obviously. Well, I write about that in Better Than Before because it was kind of like this huge experience in my life because it was so unexpected that I just was able to do it so quickly. And what I talk about there is I, I happened to read a book called Why We Get Fat by Gary Tobbs, which is really all about insulin. My sister's a type one diabetic. So I'm, I was very interested in that, especially at that time in the role of insulin in the body. So that's why I happened to read that book because I wanted to understand more about insulin. And he just really made this case for why, you know, insulin is sparked by foods with carbohydrates. And so if you if you don't want your insulin to go up, just avoid those foods. And I just this was and in better than before. I talk about this is the strategy of the lightning bolt. This is one of the most effective ways to change a habit. But it kind of has to happen to you. You can't make it happen the way you can do the strategy of pairing or the strategy of scheduling or something. So I was just so struck by this book and the ideas in this book that I just overnight changed all my eating habits. And I just I quit sugar. I basically I, I gave up most carbs except for like nuts and leafy vegetables. And it just stuck. And so I think at that time, I was so swept up in kind of the newness of it. You know, sometimes like when you start something new, there's all this like excitement and energy kind of makes it easy to start to kind of you're rolling down a hill at the beginning and then it gets harder as you continue and continue. And I think what happened was it was such a new way of eating. And I was eating all kinds of foods that I had before been avoiding. And so that was sort of fun and satisfying. And then I think that sort of that switchover happened pretty seamlessly. So I think I was very fortunate. Like, I'm not saying, I mean, your mileage may vary in terms of how this would unfold for somebody. But that's how I did it. I read this book. I decided, okay, I'm going to just change everything overnight. I did it. And by the time I was sort of accustomed to it, all that noise had really faded because I was somebody who like, you know, back in the day when everybody would sit in a meeting, you know, you'd sit in a meeting, there'd be a plate of cookies for two hours. I'd be like, I don't want to have a cookie. I don't want to have a cookie. And then I would eat three cookies on my way out the door. You know, like I, it was just always on my mind. Oh, we have ice cream in the freezer now, later, today, tomorrow, two bites, three bites. It's my birthday, all that. I just was so bored of it. It was so tiring. And so then when I gave it up, I was like, this is great. 
you know, somebody said to me, what's the fun of life without a brownie? And I thought, oh, life without a brownie is so much more fun for me than any brownie could ever be. But again, I'm not saying this is true for everyone. Absolutely not. There are moderators who like to have things sometimes or a little bit. I'm not saying this would work for everybody or that I'm recommending. I'm just saying it's something that puzzled me from my own experience. And it wasn't until I wrote The Life in Five Senses that my own experience made sense to me because I understood how my five senses were contributing to my inner experience. You mentioned the thing about living in New York City and hearing the sirens, which I've heard in the course of this podcast. I don't know if they'll be in the final edit because it may be, you know, processed out by accident or, or even right. on purpose. Doesn't Wait, matter. Wait, Eric, I think there's one right now. There literally is. And so and it's totally fine. <laughs> right. It doesn't it doesn't bother me. <laughs> yeah. And I don't even hear it because I sometimes it would be like, oh, let's wait for my dog to start barking. But I don't even hear it. Yeah. But I liken that to this sweet tooth thing where, again, the plate of cookies and the siren, two different senses, two things that are present, but you got to the point where your senses acclimated and said, that's not useful information. Yeah, it's acclimation is the perfect word for it. It's, I'm acclimated to it. And, you know, we've all had this experience where, like, you get a dog and then all of a sudden you're like, wow, I know I never noticed all the, like, pet stores in my neighborhood because... Your brain was like, I don't need to splash that information for you because it's not useful. Or like you love music. You probably when you are like scrolling through your day or looking at the newspaper, or whatever, you probably see a lot of things about concerts and performances because that's interesting to you. I almost never get to a concert or performance. I'm not a huge music person. So my brain doesn't make that stuff jump out of the page at me. So this is something we're all very familiar with. And yet it was still a, or super surprising to me to realize just how is how concrete it is, like how much this really is happening. It's not just like nobody can decide what color the dress is. And it's kind of this one time, you know, phenomenon. It's happening all the time. Well, it's funny you mentioned that music and going out in the public, because one of the things for me that it's a blessing and a curse is going into a restaurant or into a public space where there is music playing. For me, it's like part of the atmosphere. It's a factor like temperature or how many people are spaced together or grouped yes. together, how loud the music, how soft it is. But regardless of the volume of the music, my brain is always going, oh, what song is this? And trying to like, it's almost an internal trivia game of how soon can I figure out what song it is? See, that is such a perfect example because I'm very sensitive to the noise level. If it's loud, I don't like it. If it's, you know, and so I'm aware of that. But for you, it's the, actual content of the music. Like I remember uh, talking to a friend who sounds just very much like you. And she said she finds it like very distracting even to be like in a drugstore when they're playing music because she's like, if there's music, I stop and listen because her brain is just like music, music, music. And same thing with you. Like you're having a whole extra level. You might choose a restaurant because they have such an amazing playlist. Whereas for me, I'd be like, oh, do they play music? I didn't even notice that. Right. Because our brains are they're helping us. They're looking for what we want to know and what we need to experience. That's a perfect example. I love that, that for you, that is a factor in a way that it just doesn't matter to me. Well, you mentioned earlier, you turn the radio off in the car. So for me, that's also different because I turn music on. And I love listening to podcasts in the car, too. So both those things actually make me more aware when it's silent, I start to like panic and look everywhere and any sound I hear, any si like any siren I hear or any, you know, anything like that. I'm always just like looking in all the mirrors constantly, like fleeting back and forth between them all. Whereas I'm calm and I'm enjoying the ride. And even if it's spoken word, like if somebody probably somebody's listening to this right now while they're driving, I hope right. you're having a good experience, by the way. But that's for me, that helps me. Long car trips. It's like a five, six hour drive for me to go like to Nashville to visit friends and or go to events sometimes. And that's a perfect shot to like, all right, I've got my podcasts queued up. And then sometimes I'll pull out, you know, specific playlists. But that helps me. And that's a great point, which is just as we all have, like live in these different sensory surroundings, it's really useful to think about shaping your sensory surrounding. And I used to be much more passive, like sort of like... My surroundings are my surroundings. But exactly what you're saying, it's like we should really think about ourselves and what works for us and try to, and try as much as we can. Obviously, you can't control everything to shape it to suit ourselves. And people are very different. So we're talking about how as maybe feeling jumpy in the car, 
you like to have music or podcasts, whereas I feel like I feel more comfortable when in silence. So it's not that one of us is right and one of us is wrong. It's just that different approaches work for us. You see this in sort of like workplace productivity. Some people want silence like me. Some people like music. Maybe you work to music. Some people like my brother-in-law likes a busy hum. Like he works best in like a coffee shop where there's a lot of people talking, but it's not like coworkers where he's kind of like, what's my boss saying or whatever. It's just the chatter. It's just bustle. That's what he likes. And, and sometimes people, you know, will listen to white noise or pink noise or green noise or coffee shop noise or library noise to try to get themselves in the auditory environment that helps them to thrive. Once you realize, and, and I did this, like, if you have kids, you might say, turn off your music so you can do your homework more effectively. And your kid says, no, I like having the music on. No one's right. No one's wrong. People really thrive in different sensory surroundings. And people are often bothered by different sensory things. And so like if you're working with somebody or you're living with somebody who's like, wow, that smell really bothers me or this shirt is so uncomfortable, I can't wear it. It's instead of just dismissing it and saying like, what's the big deal? This is not important or like this isn't anything to worry about to think, well, their sensory experience could be very different from mine, probably is very different from mine. If it's a problem for them, let's figure out how to address it rather than saying that there's some kind of like, this is fine. Because you're like, well, if it's bothering somebody, we need to figure that out. I'm completely in sync with you about the different auditory environments. And honestly, for me, I've found that depending upon the type of work is Ah. what dictates. So if it's brainstorming, if it's sitting and just kind of pouring over a book and like yours or sitting there with a, a big legal pad and a cup of coffee in a public coffee shop and just writing down all the things, you know, doing a David Allen brain dump kind of yeah, approach. Right. Perfect for that. Sometimes I will play music that has no lyrics, like from Brain FM, and mm. it gets you into a brain state of focus, you know, puts the blinders up like the Clydesdale horses where it blinds them and they can't look left or right, just forward. And they focus on a task at hand for about, you know, half hour to an hour or even two hours. I've done two hours straight just listening to music that has no lyrics and is designed Mm -hmm. to do that. And then there are other times where I will play music out of big speak, well, not big speakers, but smaller speakers here that are stereo that have lyrics and are like uplifting and fun. And like, it's a certain playlist. And I just say, Hey, I won't say it right now, but hey, thing that plays my music, code word, play my something something playlist. And it's like it starts to rock out like with varying degrees and it's a playlist. And in that moment, that is for lifting up my mood, getting me like, all right, let's get like let's get into this. And that's like honestly, that's like email. (laughs) Really, it's like it makes the email fun. So right. Well, again, this is a great example of how you can shape your sensory environment to support whatever it is that you're trying to get done. And, you know, I am not, as I said, I'm not a music person. So one of the things that I really gained in doing Life in Five Senses is I really tapped into my sense of hearing so much more than was my natural inclination. Like, I love the sense of smell. So I was already doing a lot with the sense of smell just kind of on my own on in the wild. But I needed a lot of deliberate work to get me into more hearing based things, which is good because as you say, I mean, research shows that listening to music is one of the quickest, easiest ways to intervene in our mood. It can give us more energy. It can calm us down. It can help us deal with pain more effectively. It can help us synchronize movements with other people. As you say, it can just make a kind of a dreary experience much more fun as you've done several times in your life. What's interesting is all human cultures have music. It's a universal, ancient cultural phenomenon. There's a lot of debate about why that might be. Why do we all have music? It's a super fascinating subject within the five senses. It's just like the subtopic of music. I was not such a music person. You are truly deeply music. I wasn't. So there was a lot of low hanging fruit for me to experiment with because I wasn't so sound focused. Whereas for someone like you, like that might be your most appreciated sense, it sounds like. That might be. I would have to think about that. I mean, again, it was a revelation to be able to see more clearly these last two years than I had probably for the previous three or four as my eyesight was degrading slowly and unnoticeably by myself. So we've talked a little bit about sight. We've talked about sound. I want to go back to something. You talked about the sweet tooth thing, and obviously one of the senses is taste. I'm curious then how... You know, somebody who's thinking, okay, self-experiments over the course of a year, one of the senses is taste. 
how did you, and I'm going to do air quotes, how did you indulge yourself? Because I think some people would naturally think, oh, well, she went and tasted all these amazing things, lots of them very, very sweet. I'm curious, in light of the context of your sweet tooth and the dialing down of, or, or the turning down of the dial, what were those taste experiments or savoring or, you know, what was those self-experiments in terms of taste like for you? Well, I have to say, you know, my most neglected sense was taste, which probably is one of the reasons it was easy for me to give up sweets. It's because in a way I'm not a foodie and I never have had much appreciation for the sense of taste. So again, like hearing there was a lot of low hanging fruit for me to go after to like, even given that I there's all this stuff that I really stay away from to really go deeper into my sense of taste. So one thing that I did, which I loved, I highly recommend, and I did lift my in my no sweets rule for this because it was such a small experiment. I had a taste party with some friends. And so I had friends over and we just did taste tests because I had gone to Flavor University, which is this two day thing. And my favorite thing we did at Flavor University is we would do taste tests. And, and there we did like different kinds of milk, like, you know, cream, whole milk, 2%. Oat milk, nut milk, just to see the difference of milks, different energy bars. And I was like so excited because when you really notice what something tastes like, it's just, it's much more interesting than you would think, even for someone like me who's not a foodie. And so I had my friends over and we tasted things like varieties of apples. We chewed on one almond. I was like, just eat one almond and really notice it. And people were like, this is amazing. What I learned is one almond tastes so much better than like a handful of almonds because you really, really notice it. And it was just fun. It was like everyone was laughing and talking. It's just like a very, very fun thing to do. I had a mystery drink, which turned out to be Red Bull. Nobody knew. People were like, what is this? And then I did it with myself, like olives. Like I've always like, I like olives. But then I thought there's a million kind of olives. Which ones do I like better? I never even thought to try to figure it out. So I went to the store, got like, it was called Festival Mix. So it was all different kinds of olives, sorted them out, looked them up on the internet, figured out their names, and then taste tested them. And I'm like, actually, I really like the classic black olive. I was like, this is the most basic thing ever. But that truly is the olive that I love. And all the other olives, I don't like nearly as much. And so I had not known that about myself. But now I have a real sense of how I stand in the great world of olives. And it's just fun. It's kind of fun to connect with your body. It's fun to notice all these subtleties and all these distinctions, try to put words to it. And then because I knew myself better, now I can make better choices. I'm like, if you offer me some olives, I'm going to get a black olive. The classic is what I like. Sounds like a really good start to a charcuterie tray. No, exactly. But I mean, and you could do this with anything. I mean, charcuterie is a great example. Like, you know, there's it's all there. It's like, but they taste different from each other. But are you just like having one after the other after the other and not really registering it? That's a great example. And I can never remember what things are called. I'm always asking my husband, do I like that? Do I like cod better or do I like, you know, red snapper better? I am like, okay, start paying attention to your own preferences. It was surprising to me how little I knew about my own preferences. And I, I've been able to just subtly make my life much more pleasant and convenient and easy by like, I didn't know that I didn't like Earl Grey tea. I do not like Earl Grey tea. I like English breakfast tea, but I was sort of haphazardly picking one or the other. And now I'm like, how did I not notice that I don't like Earl Grey tea? I like English breakfast tea. So now I just, I always get the tea I like. It used to be, I was sort of like, eh, sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's not so good. What are you going to do? I mean, which sounds bonkers that I would not notice that about myself. But th- that's why I had to write a book like Life in Five Senses, because I'm the kind of person who simply didn't notice. Well, and I think what we're getting at here is that, which I love about this, this is so just, it's kind of eye-opening in a lot of ways as to why I can continue to do a podcast about productivity for 10 years, because there's all these different new aspects and digging in and applying it in different ways and adding in new perspectives. You're saying a couple of different things here that I want to I want to show how different we are. I hated black olives most of my life. However... Mm. My grandmother would remind me that when we were younger, or and especially me, I would ask for a jar of green, as I would call them then, olives, uh, green olives in my stocking for Christmas. Oh, my I God. I loved them That's so much. That's hilarious. Right? That's hilarious. So there's that. And then I love Earl Grey tea. English breakfast is okay to me. I will drink it. But Earl Grey is like one of my favorites. I think that has something to do with Captain Picard on Star Trek, but that's another story. So, but what's funny is I'm curious, 
I don't know how much of a coffee or wine drinker you are. Those are the two kind of, I'm just going to say it. Those are the kind of snobby foods that people like, I taste hints of this and that and then something, something. And it's a joke. It's a very big joke on many comedy shows where they like joke about that. But like, I can't tell the difference. I can tell if it's a different flavor when it comes to like different drinks and things. But like, I can't taste notes of anything in those two drinks. But have you really tried? See, that I think is maybe the issue is I'd have to try like I think I've you know, I've done it a little bit with coffee specifically where I've tried like a really small amount. I mean, obviously black and tried a couple different kinds and thought, you know, it's either so subtle I can't detect it or I need more practice. And kind of the question in my mind is like, is the practice even worth it? Because in the end, it's so subtle a difference. Maybe there's nothing wrong with me and there's nothing wrong with those that can sense it. It's just different. And that's okay. I think part of it is, are you interested? When I write about neglected sense, a lot of it is, are you interested enough to learn? Like the more we know, the more we notice. And if you're interested in something, you you want to learn about it and you want to talk about it and you read reviews and you're, you know, you're open to information. And if you're not interested, then you you don't have that information. And so you don't perceive these distinctions and you're not interested. So I think part of it is, I remember talking to somebody, this was years ago, I was talking to somebody who was who like worked in a huge coffee company. I won't say which one, but whatever, you would know it. And I was like, oh, I love coffee. And she goes, oh, what kinds of coffee do you like? And I was just like, black coffee. I, I, I The idea that you would have nuance, I was like, oh, that's way beyond me. I'm, my, my sister said she likes diner coffee the best. That's her favorite kind of coffee. But I did because I because I wrote Life in Five Senses. I did allow myself to like splurge on some kind of unusual items. And one is this thing. I think it's called Ne Cafe, N-E-Z, you know, which is French for nose, Ne Cafe. And there's also Ne De Vin, I think, uh, if I'm getting the names right. And it's a kit that you buy that has all the smells pulled out. So there's like potato and melted butter and cinnamon and rubber and whatever distilled all for coffee so that you can smell them isolated so that then when you're experiencing coffee, it's you can kind of pull out that note more easily. And so if you were interested in doing it, and certainly for wine, this is so so built out, you could go deep into it and probably you would be able to perceive much more than you think now because you just haven't focused your attention on it. You haven't tried to pull it apart. I noticed that with when we were eating the apples with my friends, I had a whole list of adjectives. So I would say to people, how does this taste? And they would sort of grope for words, but then I'm like, is it mealy? Is it juicy? Is it lemony? Is it floral? Is it astringent? And like, as you're tasting and the words are being suggested to you, you start to be able to perceive that nuance and be able to, like you say, it's like putting the glasses on. All of a sudden there's more clarity. And I think this is why the neglected sense in a way is really fun. I have a quiz, the neglected sense quiz on my website. It's good to know it because then you, just like you, you might be like, you know what? I've spent so much time on music. It's super fun. But now I feel like I, I want to shake myself up. Why don't I take a coffee class with a friend and like really just like see what I can get out of coffee? Maybe there's more there to explore or to enjoy. Or if nothing else, I'll have fun with a friend doing something kind of out of the ordinary. Yeah, that's a great idea. And I think that's right. I think and I will say that I do notice like I definitely can tell the difference. I am not a tasting notes kind of coffee snob, but I'm a beans kind of coffee snob, I guess is the best way to put it. I buy our coffee for our house. My wife can't tell the difference. My daughter either. My son doesn't drink it, but uh, I buy local. It gets shipped in. They roast it local. It's really good beans. No knock on Dunkin Donuts. Love you, Dunkin Donuts. But probably should pick a different one. Like, I'm, I'm not going to throw any coffee company under the bus. But, you, you know, your generic coffee companies that sure. you find in a tin at the supermarket versus these beans that are high quality and I roast myself. I can tell the difference there. So I think there's probably a threshold to then go a little further. So I think this is a great suggestion to do the class. Okay, that's true. But here, let me throw this study into the mix. Okay. They did a step because this, again, is how your brain is giving you information that you want. They did a study of I I think it was college students and asked them to rate different coffees. And for people who were who identified as very environmentally conscious, the coffee that was labeled like eco friendly or green or whatever, they rated as tasting better than the regular coffee. So this is how your brain might shape your perception based on your values. And so it truly tastes better to you because your brain is like, this is better coffee. 
No, I'm also my taste better, like objectively because of what you're processing or shipping times or whatever. But it is also interesting that our values can shape our experiences in the same way. Oh my gosh. I just found out I'm a fraud. Anyways, no, no, no. I, I'm no, kidding. No, I'm no. kidding. And, and, that's just, it's funny. Uh, that's exactly right. I, I love this because it may be that there are other sensory and as well as internal, emotional and intellectual factors that are bleeding into the way we are interpreting that sensory input. Oh, absolutely. No, it's like, it's like my friend who was like, I saw her and she's like, Oh my gosh, I just smelled some Dracar Noir on the subway and it's ruined my whole day. That was my ex-husband's cologne. (laughs) And I was like, no, you know, I mean, for somebody else, it's like, oh, it's my, you know, it's like my first date or whatever. It's, you know, all these things carry their own very, very personal associations for us. Yeah, there's so much power here. And and honestly, we've, I think we've spent the majority of the time talking here on one, the benefits, two, We've definitely talked sight. We've talked sound. We've spent some time now on on taste. Obviously, there's two other senses, touch as well as smell. You just, we're talking about smell. We won't really go into those now, but like, there's so much, like, I'm really excited to do some more digging. And and again, in a lot along the lines of taking the coffee class and jumping off points, there's so many jumping off points is I guess what I'm saying to really do more self-discovery, not just for our own personal well-being and enrichment, but I guess it bleeds into a better understanding of ourselves in a lot of ways. Like, again, I talked about the Enneagram when we first started talking. This is feeding into a better understanding of myself, which then helps me to understand how I interact with the world, which for me leads to, again, a better life, which is, again, one of the things that has to do with productivity. So I want to point people to the quiz that you talked about, as well as the book, as we're talking about this, it's not yet out, but as this releases, it is. And I would love to point people to your site to get the quiz and the book. Yes. GretchenRubin.com, just my name.com. You can find everything about the book. You can read an excerpt. You can pre-order it there or, or order it, depending on when you're listening. You can take the quiz. You can uh, sign up for my five things newsletter. I have a podcast, Happier with Gretchen Rubin. You can check that out there. So, and I'm all over social media as, as I, Gretchen Rubin is my handle. And I love to hear from people because I feel like the world is my research assistant. Just like you've given me two great examples <laughs> and, a, and a reading assignment, just talking to you. And I feel like I get so many ideas and resources and observations and questions from people. So hit me up wherever you are. But for all things related to any of my work, GretchenRubin.com is the hub. Awesome. I will make sure to link up the site as well as I'll link out to the podcast directly and things like that so people can find that. But Gretchen, it's I mean, it's always awesome talking to you. I was so glad that this comes around. So open invitation next time, next book, whatever. It always fits. They all fit. Honestly, yeah. we're so. interested in so many of the same things. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. It's so always so much fun to talk to you. Yes. yes. Thanks again, Gretchen. Great talking with you as always. Thank you. So what did you think? I hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Gretchen Rubin as much as I did revisiting it. And I hope you can see why I wanted to revisit it. I think there's a lot of power in the five senses. I really resonated with her and her transformation experience, as well as that kind of awakening one in myself and being more aware, I think, this year of the way that the five senses play into my being and being human, and the importance of that. I thought that this was a perfect time to revisit that, and I hope that you did too. And again, I hope that if this was the second time or however many times you've played back this conversation, it drove a little deeper. It resonated a little more with you. If it resonated with you, I'd love for you to share this conversation with somebody else that you know it will also resonate with. Would you do me that favor? Hit the share button in your podcast player app of choice, wherever you're listening to this. Or again, head on over to the show notes at beyondthetodolist.com. Share it from there. That's also where you can send in your questions for the mailbag episode coming up. All you need to do again is while you're there at beyondthetodolist.com, go to the top of the page, click contact. It'll send me an email with your message and you will be on the show again beyond the to-do list.com top of the page click contact send me a message that's all you need to do thank you again for sharing thank you for listening and i will see you next episode